<laughs> We're in a bit of a, a period time machine here. In the age of the machine, every decade is defined by its engineering masterpieces. So join me on a journey through time as I experience the great machines that changed people's lives and shaped modern Britain. The 1980s was a turning point for Britain. It was out with the old and in with the new. After a decade of strikes, oil crises and a steady decline in our manufacturing industries, the country was close to bankruptcy. Britain's first female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, or the Iron Lady, called for new thinking, new ways of doing business. Out of the ashes of the old ways, a new spirit of invention and ambition was emerging. This was the dawn of the computer age, advanced materials and electronics. For me, the 1980s was the decade when modern Britain finally arrived. Ah, hello, Maggie. What's that you say? The future has landed? In the 1980s, the car was the star. In 1985, one British car found fame as a time machine in the blockbuster movie Back to the Future. The director, Robert Zemeckis, was after a car that would look like a UFO. The shiny, futuristic DeLorean was just the job. It made its first leap through time in typical 80s fashion, by remote control. As Doc said to Marty, if my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're gonna see some serious, uh, stuff. The movie was a huge hit, but ironically, this sci-fi icon had already been taken out of production. What on earth was going on? It all began with John DeLorean, automotive wunderkind and vice president of America's General Motors. In 1973, he quit his high-paid job to pursue his dream. To design and produce a car of his own. A car that would be far ahead of its time. DeLorean set out to defy the conventions of automobile manufacture by making a unique-looking machine with the performance of a sports car for the price of a family saloon and, this is the radical bit, to make a car that would last a lifetime. DeLorean called in Colin Chapman from the Lotus Formula One team to engineer the car, and in 1981, backed to the tune of £88 million by the British government, the DMC-12 went into production. It's pretty well known that things didn't go according to plan. DeLorean went bankrupt very publicly, and his car was widely slated. But what's been lost in the mists of time is whether the DMC was actually any good. I've come to a very special workshop hidden away in Kent to check out the engineering behind the icon. The vast majority of cars like this classic XJS use regular steel body panels. It's strong, it's cheap, pretty much ideal for mass producing cars. But if you don't keep it in absolutely perfect condition, it rusts. So you either had to restore the car or go out and buy a new one. DeLorean wanted his cars to last a lifetime, so he used stainless steel instead. Yes, the DeLorean's striking coat is bare, rust-resistant metal. But you don't see many cars made of this stuff. Stainless steel isn't cheap. Neither were the impressive, now famous, gullwing doors. The doors were intended to give the look of a bird in flight, all part of DeLorean's grand plans for a design that would make people stop and stare. 
but their steel torsion bars and hydraulic rams proved very expensive, and the cool doors also created a serious safety issue. DeLorean planned a one-piece molded plastic body shell for his car. It seemed like a clever, cheap solution. But Colin Chapman from Lotus took one look at the designs and knew there was a problem. A plastic body with massive gaps for the doors just wouldn't be safe with a heavy rear-mounted V6 engine. So Chapman redesigned the DMC with a steel chassis. Simple solution, but not cheap. Despite spiralling costs, DeLorean's dream car went into production and was launched in January 1981. The commercial said, drive the DeLorean, live the dream today. You even received a letter from him outlining his hopes for your car. Handle well, be enormous fun to drive, last a lifetime. Well, let's see if it measures up, shall we? Critics called the DeLorean sluggish with poor handling, which you wouldn't expect from a 2.8 litre V6. Yeah, I'll say this for it, it does go a bit. The problem was DeLorean's target market was America, where road laws demanded catalytic converters which sat 25% of the engine's power and raised suspension, making it wallow around corners. Not great for a sports car. Thankfully, I'm enjoying an unmodified UK version. I'm left with the conclusion that maybe DeLorean almost achieved what he was trying to do in terms of the cost of a family saloon, the performance of a sports car, and a car that would last a lifetime. To stay afloat, DeLorean needed to sell 10,000 cars a year, but didn't come close. A mixture of overambition, market misjudgment, and Lotus re-engineering doubled the price to £12,000, or $25,000 for the American market, and it simply wasn't a $25,000 sports car. After less than two years in production, with only 9,000 cars in existence and DeLorean embroiled in scandal, the company went bankrupt. DeLorean did, however, achieve his dream of a car that would last a lifetime. Three decades into the future, this one's still shining. A great sci-fi icon, but a commercial failure. At least the DMC-12 had shown there was huge potential to shake up industry with new ideas and new technology. And the British government had shown that it was willing to try new ways of doing business. In the early 80s, new ideas and new thinking swept across Britain. New looks, new music, new... Uh, romantics. And there was a new brand of incisive political satire on the scene too. <laughs> Whole new industries were starting up, fueled by revolutions in electronics and computers. And Britain was very much in the frame thanks to one of Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher's favourite eccentric entrepreneurs. Sir Clive Sinclair was the hero of all those British schoolchildren who could persuade their parents to buy them a computer. To help them with their homework, of course. With the brilliant ZX Spectrum, Sinclair introduced the world's smallest and cheapest home computer, just £125. Right, paper that, paper that, right, paper that, slow down, slow down, how do I have to get slowed down? No, I wasn't going to hit that, I'm sorry. How were people entertained by this back then? I'll never know. But 
I'm finding it strangely addictive. Let's go again. Thanks to Clive. Sinclair wasn't just a computer boffin, and in 1985 he revealed his next trailblazing creation to the world. Welcome to the future, the Sinclair C5. Was it a car? Was it a bike? This was step one of Sinclair's vision for the future of electric vehicles. It was actually an electric tricycle. By keeping the speed below 15 miles an hour and the weight below 60 kilos, Sinclair was able to build an electric vehicle that needed no road tax, no insurance and no driving license. You didn't even need a crash helmet. It sounds clever. And although I've never heard anything good said about the C5, I suppose I should at least give it a chance. Right, I'm approaching a gentle hill now. And this, I feel, may well be a, some sort of challenge for it. I do have the finger firmly on the button and it's getting embarrassing. Yes, I'm going to have to give it a little bit of pedal assistance. Reversing was, I would have said, not one of its strongest... Uh, in fact, it doesn't reverse. I'm doing the reversing now. Um, so embarrassing. And I've forgotten the expression that uh, Sinclair <laughs> gave it, but it's a sort of 80-point turn <laughs> using your legs. It's a useless machine, really. <laughs> Now it's bleeping at me. Sorry, Sir Clive. I just can't find your trademark genius in this machine. Geronimo! Before I write it off, I'm going to meet a real-life C5 engineer from the 80s. Can Adam Harper turn me into a believer? Now let's start with the battery, which I gather is, is a third of of the weight of the, the entire vehicle. But it is a special battery. It's uh, designed to be recharged many, many times. Right, let's move on to this item here, which to me looks like a small washing machine motor. The car was assembled by Hoover, and many years ago uh, it was written um, that it was a washing machine motor. And the, the fact is, it never was. Um, it, it was a specially designed motor by Phillips, uh, and it was a technical breakthrough. The last item is this rather odd shape. It looks one end of a clothes rail to, to me. Um, Adam, tell me all about it. It's a box section chassis. Clive went along to Lotus Sports Cars, and so they designed uh, this chassis, um, which is a fantastic piece of engineering because it's immensely strong and weighs Next nothing. nothing. It's, it's, uh... well, I suppose with the battery weighing half a ton, something's got to be light. You've got to, yeah. <laughs> So maybe there is more to this machine than meets the eye. And its iconic body shell is high-tech too. Sinclair's team spent months improving the aerodynamics in a wind tunnel, making it 75% more efficient than a regular cycle. The better the aerodynamic efficiency, the further you could go on one charge. Oh. Oh. About 20 miles, according to the brochure. Sinclair's runabout went on the market in January 1985 for just under £400, a thousand pounds in today's money. But before it even hit the streets, most journalists were writing it off. Right from the start, the C5 scared people. They thought its low profile would be too dangerous once you get out amongst the trucks and cars. Was that fair? Let's find out. I've got a full charge and a tune-up, and it's time to give the C5 a second chance. Off to the supermarket, 1980s style. And you get amazing looks from people thinking, that person there is completely mad, and they'd be right. On a flattish road, it rolls along at a decent lick, 
with no effort on my part. There we go, we're successfully around there. In the traffic, one does feel incredibly vulnerable. This isn't even a busy road. You've got to give credit to Sir Clive. He put his reputation and £7 million behind his creation. OK, so the boot's a bit small. In fact, the machine is far from perfect. But it's actually quite a bit better than I expected. Bad press may have killed off the C5, but the idea of electric runabouts just hasn't gone away. With better batteries and electric motors, Sinclair's vision is finally becoming reality with quiet, clean electric machines that even have decent sized boots. Maybe Sinclair was just a bit too far ahead of his time. Although both the DeLorean and the C5 were commercial failures, they were iconic trailblazers that embodied the pioneering spirit of 1980s Britain. But the nation Thatcher had inherited was in turmoil. The 70s had seen oil crises, civil unrest and strikes across British industry. Then in 1982, a war came along that united the nation. One of the country's most important and successful industries was about to face a make or break test. Since World War II, our engineers had been very successful in developing ingenious military machines. But with one type of machine, we'd been lagging behind international rivals. A versatile, complex machine vital to all modern warfare. I've come to 815 Squadron at Royal Naval Air Station, Yeovilton to see the great British helicopter that raised the bar for all that followed. The fantastic Westland Lynx. The fastest, most maneuverable helicopter in the world. This is a Royal Navy HAS Mark III Lynx, a direct descendant of the original Lynx. It took over a decade and tens of millions of pounds to develop, and by 1982, Westland was struggling to survive. The Lynx was designed to replace two aging Royal Navy helicopters, the Wasp and the Wessex and on the international arms market to rival America's great Vietnam icon, the Bell Huey. Westland's designers knew their future depended on the success of the Lynx, so they pulled out all the stops with new performance-enhancing technologies. Up here we have two Rolls-Royce Gem engines, each producing 800 horsepower. They were specially designed for the Lynx insofar as they're much more compact than other gas turbine engines of similar output. But the real work of genius on the Lynx was its rotor hub, the mechanical rotor control system, which in most other helicopters has lots of hinges, vital for stable flight. So Fluff, why is the rotor head so, in, so key to the performance of this helicopter? It is one of the key components of any helicopter. Um, and with the Lynx aircraft, the, the rotor hub itself is very, very different. What we have on the Lynx is what's called a semi-rigid rotor head. And the reason that is, is we only have one hinge. The flexible rotor hub becomes the hinge. If I was to press down on the head itself, you can I actually see, it, see yeah. the flexing. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the titanium itself which absorbs that flight load. The titanium is the key thing that allows us to have this rotor head on this aircraft, which makes the aircraft so manoeuvrable and agile. With new materials and innovative design, Westland kept the Lynx's weight to a minimum, maximising its weapons carrying capability from depth charges to torpedoes and missiles. Well, let's say lethal blue missile attached. What is it and what does it do? Well, this is the Sea Skewer missile. 
Uh, it's a, uh, a sea skimming missile, semi-active, uh, and is controlled by the radar that's on board of the, uh, the Lynx. Why is the Lynx so good? The Lynx is fast, it's agile, uh, it can uh, hover outside of the, the enemy's uh, missile zone, uh, and it's perfectly designed to give a stable platform for firing skewer away and getting the maximum chance of, uh, of prosecuting the enemy. And prosecute it would. The Lynx rotor system was designed to be deliberately unstable, giving it spectacular evasive maneuverability when under attack. But it was also given a state-of-the-art automatic flight control system, not an autopilot, but a computer that assists the pilot to keep the aircraft steady to fire weapons, and enabling the Lynx to boast the ability to land on the tiny rear deck of a frigate in anything up to a Force 8 gale. The Royal Navy Lynx went into service in 1976, bristling with untested potential. Six years later, that potential was put to the most extreme test imaginable. In April 1982, Argentina invaded the remote British-owned Falkland Islands. Within 48 hours, Margaret Thatcher sent more than 70 vessels and 25,000 troops to war 8,000 miles away in the middle of the South Atlantic winter. They would be vastly outnumbered against an enemy fighting close to home. Twenty-seven Royal Navy Lynx helicopters sailed with the task force to protect our ships against enemy submarines and surface vessels. During the conflict, the Lynx performed its role perfectly, crippling one submarine with a torpedo and three Argentine surface vessels with the new radar-guided sea skewer missiles. Not a single Lynx was lost to enemy fire. Back in the UK, Westland now had an opportunity to turn the combat success of the Lynx into international sales that would save the company. First, they made it even better. With experimental swept-back blade tips designed to allow the Lynx's rotors to turn faster than ever before. In August 1986, with the new so-called Burt blades and uprated engines, a Westland Lynx made an attempt on the world helicopter speed record. We're now travelling at 170 miles an hour and we can't possibly keep up with the specially adapted Lynx. The Lynx clocked 249.09 miles an hour, a record that still stands today and cemented the reputation of this great British helicopter. A fantastic machine that by staying at the forefront of modern technology has now sold to 18 different countries around the world. In May 1982, as the Falklands conflict entered its final stages, troops on the ground played the central role. Not least the men of Two Para, backed up by kit from all over the world. I've got my gun from Belgium, my pack from China, my troop carrier from Scandinavia, but one crucial piece of equipment that's very much British. The F-107 Scimitar Reconnaissance Vehicle. Light, 
agile and incredibly fast whatever the terrain. One of the greatest military vehicles of all time. This amazing machine came into being when car manufacturer Alvis was asked to build a range of fast military vehicles. So light, they could be dropped onto a battlefield from the air. The problem was that a steel machine would have weighed in at 13 tons, far too heavy for air transport. Getting the new vehicle down to weight took some radical thinking and a new type of aluminium alloy, DGFV1318B to be precise. And this is it, a lot stronger than pure aluminium, but still a lot lighter than steel. Overall weight saving, five tons. To keep costs down, Alvis used the same chassis for their whole range, from the Scorpion tank to the Spartan, Samson, Scimitar and Samaritan, with rolls from missile launcher to ambulance. All were eight-ton vehicles, seven times lighter than a main battle tank, perfect for air transport. The Scimitar has a ground pressure of under five pounds per square inch. In other words, this eight-ton machine next to me puts the same amount of pressure on each inch of ground as me with my full kit. Seriously lightweight. But the aluminium armour was only strong enough to withstand grenades and small arms fire. So the new machines would rely on speed and manoeuvrability to keep them out of harm's way. The Scimitar was powered by the 4.2-litre Jaguar engine, much the same lump as you'd find in an E-Type sports car. It was the only engine around that was light and powerful enough to meet the size, weight and high performance requirements for the new range of tanks. Alvis combined the engine with an ingenious transmission system to produce the racing car of tanks that could speed across the combat zone at up to 70 miles an hour, as I'm finding out, thanks to my driver, tank collector Andrew Baker. It was basically designed to charge around the battlefield, reconnoiter the enemy, and then run away. But it also has a high-precision, rapid-fire Raden cannon just in case. Andrew, can I have a go? Yes, certainly. Most tanks corner by putting the brakes on one track and skidding, but the Scimitar's clever transmission system sends more power to the track on the outside of the bend, so you don't lose speed. <laughs> and you can also spin on a sixpence. Well, nearly, I am a beginner. <laughs> Perhaps the most amazing bit of all, it can do it all exactly the same in reverse. And in theory at least, 70 miles an hour backwards. I'm having so much fun! In 1982, this amazing machine was put to the test for the first time in real combat conditions. The British Army took four scimitars and four scorpions to the Falklands, where the boggy conditions were no place for heavy machines like tanks. At least, normal tanks. The British drivers soon worked out how to handle the conditions. 
This is where the combination of speed and lightweight came into its own. If a driver spotted some green moss, he knew he was coming up to softer ground. Full throttle, seventh gear, go like the clappers. By early June, British troops supported by the tanks had cornered the Argentine forces on the outskirts of Port Stanley. The final battles were for high ground overlooking the town, including Wireless Ridge. At 8.30 p.m. on the 13th of June, 1982, A and B Company of 2 Para led the assault on Wireless Ridge. They were accompanied by two scimitars and two scorpion tanks of the Blues and Royals. The scimitars and scorpions embarked on what is known as a noisy attack, revving their engines and firing their cannons, hoping to cause fear and confusion in the enemy. worked. By dawn, the Argentine army was holed up in Port Stanley. Later that day, Argentina surrendered the islands. A victory for British national pride, the heroism of the troops, and some great British machines. Well done, chaps. Like the Lynx, the Scimitar has become a global success, selling to over 19 countries. Thanks to new technology and ingenious design, our weapons industry has thrived. And strong exports have helped us maintain a powerful military force. By the mid-80s, new technologies were filtering into everyday life. OK, there was still a bit of work to be done. But in the 1980s, this was state-of-the-art. The Prime Minister, please. Ah, good news, ma'am. In the North Sea, Britain had struck black gold. And with oil pouring in, the economy boomed. Now we had the cash, as well as the ideas, to create Maggie's capitalist utopia. What better way to get to your city job than in a car built to celebrate an oil-guzzling pastime? A 1980 Lotus Esprit Turbo in eye-melting Essex petroleum colours. This car was born of a cottage industry, which in the 1980s suddenly became big business, with Britain holding the reins. Motorsport had come of age. At the forefront was Formula One. Many of the fastest and most technically advanced cars on the track were British built. And for me, the greatest pioneers of all were Lotus. The brains behind the team was, of course, Colin Chapman, the man who fixed the DeLorean. I've come to classic Team Lotus to learn about the Chapman innovations that ushered in the modern F1 era. Chapman's mantra was performance through lightweight. If you could make it lighter, it would be faster with better handling, while being less demanding on brakes and tyres. All good news for racing. Chapman was known for pushing boundaries taking on bigger teams with bigger budgets by outthinking them, in turn driving the evolution of the modern F1 car. With cars like this 1970 Lotus 72, Chapman produced a blueprint that all F1 cars follow today. The pointed nose, the monocoque, the side pods encasing the radiators, and the front and rear wings. In the early 80s, the team pushed aerodynamics to the limit, 
creating huge downforce to glue their cars to the track through corners. But metal bodywork could no longer handle the massive forces, as Colin Chapman's son Clive explains. The downforce that the cars were creating meant that they could go around the corners incredibly quickly. The suspension got stiffer and stiffer and um, the poor old aluminium tub wasn't really able to cope and rivets started popping out and what have you. Um, so that was a problem. So with the metal monocoque under so much strain from the various forces, what was the answer? Um, well, at about that time, aerospace and, and defence were starting to investigate the potential of carbon fibre. And my father um, was always quick to encourage innovation and um, they said, well, let's try carbon and came up with the first uh, composite tub in F1. Composites are not only stiffer and lighter, but they're also easier to shape than metal. First, layers of fabric are built up on a mould. The completed section is placed in a press where resin is added, and it's baked for half an hour. The result is a stiff, strong and very light component capable of protecting a driver in a major impact. Fire. Wouldn't want to get your finger in there, would you? Glass fibre composites absorb the energy and half the crash structure remains intact. Glass fibre had been around for a while, but in 1982 it was the new, although far more expensive, carbon fibre that interested Chapman. With carbon fibre, the material is three times stiffer than aluminium and half the weight, which is why in the early 80s, this made a great new material to build a racing car. Pioneering as ever, Chapman and Lotus quickly set to work building a carbon fibre Formula One car. In 1982, with the carbon fibre monocoque Lotus 91, Chapman's vision for the future of the Formula One car had arrived. With the new lightweight and strong material in place, Formula One cars could lap faster than ever before. And if you had enough cash, you could go out and buy yourself a taste of the action. In 1980, to celebrate their glorious F1 career, Lotus launched their first ever true supercar. With a top speed of 152 miles an hour, the iconic Lotus Esprit Turbo. And here it comes. Chapman's latest creation allowed drivers to experience some of the thrills of Formula One technology. And today it's my turn, with Lotus's Director of Vehicle Engineering, Roger Becker, to guide me. Oh, right. I'm in good hands. Roger was the stunt driver for the Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. The basic principle of fast driving is not being aggressive, it's being smooth. Okay. So getting the car lined up for the corner, do your braking in a straight line. Don't drive the little piece of road a few metres in front of you. Look way, way beyond it so that you've got the car all, always prepared for the next event. The new Esprit, like most Formula One cars of the day, was turbocharged, boosting engine power by a massive 30%. Topping 150 miles an hour, it was a true supercar. Although I have to say, it's pretty hard to concentrate on Roger's instructions with all this red leather everywhere. Let's see whether a Lotus can turn you into a professional. No pressure then. Now then, focus, Barry. Feel the road, look where you're going, get over to the left. Just keep it smooth. Always give yourself the maximum width of the track by coming out in the right position for the next corner. It should seem effortless, if you're doing it right. Throttle, throttle, throttle. Producing faster lap times with less wear and tear on both car and driver. Easy, isn't it? See, it's yeah, no sweat, not even not even a drop of moisture on your brow. <laughs> well, blimey, we're no no gear at all now. Oh.
Yeah, much better. Ah, the wonderful Esprit, a true British icon with starring roles in not one, but two Bond movies. What on earth are you doing, 007? Just keeping the British end up, sir. Sadly, Lotus founder Colin Chapman died in 1982, aged just 54, never to see the full impact of his company on British motorsport. For me, Chapman's greatest achievement was his role in developing a whole new industry. With Lotus leading the way, British motorsport became a magnet for brilliant engineers. From Formula One right down to go-karts, the sport of racing became an industry worth £7 billion a year and one of Britain's most important revenue earners. But the man on the street was getting turbo envy. In the early 80s, Formula One and supercars were beyond the budget of most wannabe racing drivers. The best he could afford was a dadmobile like this classic boxy Cortina. But the Cortina would never cut it as a race machine. It was all down to aerodynamics. So this very Cortina was the last to roll off the production line in 1982. It was the end of an era for a car which sadly had the aerodynamics of a brick. Behind closed doors, Ford of Britain was working on a redesign that would change the appearance of its cars forever. After the oil crises of the 70s, Ford designers started working on a car that would be more economical than the Cortina. And their key to improved fuel efficiency was the aerodynamics. In 1982, the Cortina's replacement was unveiled. The Ford Sierra. The new streamlined design was an impressive 20% more aerodynamically efficient than the Cortina. It was an important step forward for road cars, but it was what happened next that turned the Sierra into an unlikely British icon. This man, Rod Mansfield, who headed up Ford's special vehicle engineering team, was told to turn it into a race car. So Rod, why did you take a basic family saloon car and turn it into a racing car? This car was aimed at racing and winning the World Touring Car Challenge. But before they could go racing, if they wanted any chance of winning, Rod and his team had to massively improve the performance of the basic, rather pedestrian Sierra. So we had to build onto this car here all the things that motorsport wanted. Did you think retrospectively that uh, this car that you and your department had produced what would become so synonymous with the 1980s? No, it's become an icon and I must admit it surprised me. Ford called in Formula One engine experts Cosworth to sort out the standard Sierra's rather weedy 75 horsepower Pinto block. They added a new cylinder head and another favourite bit of F1 kit. This car, just like the Lotus Esprit, was fitted with a Garrett turbocharger, really packing air into the cylinders. The uprated engine kicked out a whopping 200 horsepower. But with all that added power, the streamlined rear-wheel drive Sierra would struggle for grip on corners. So, taking technology from the likes of Formula One, the RS was given a rather large, highly distinctive rear wing, known as the whale tail. The iconic Ford Sierra RS Cosworth was complete, and to satisfy touring car rules, as well as the actual race cars, 5,000 road legal cosies were built. It was, in essence, a racing car that you could go out and buy then safely pootle about with your grandma. Although, to be honest, that wasn't really what most cosy owners had in mind. <laughs> Lovely jubbly.
where better to give it a good thrashing than back at Ford's Technical Center, on the very same track where Rod Mansfield's team put the RS through its paces in the early 80s. It has to be said that it is a car that, if you give it some beans, it likes it. It sort of says, yes, give me more. Oh, yes. Top speed had rocketed from around 100 to a staggering 150 miles an hour. Woo! Supercar performance from a family car. It's a great design, really. On the racetrack, four dominated British touring cars, with a souped-up version, the RS500, winning an unbeaten 40 races back-to-back. -back. But it was the iconic road version that played such an important role in shaping the modern car. From the jelly mold, aerodynamically efficient shape, to excess power and racetrack handling, high-performance saloons have become the norm. So next time someone's tailgating you at 90 up the M6, I'm afraid you've got the Cosy to blame. For me, the Sierra RS Cosworth epitomizes Britain in the 1980s. Bold, brash, in your face, and it was something new. It wasn't the most elegant of decades, but it was a fresh start. The teenage years of a more sophisticated high-tech Britain. Our large-scale, homegrown industries may have been dying off, but thanks to new thinking, new ideas and new technology, British engineering and design was alive and well. The future had landed, here in Britain.